This video is part of my series about Linux on external drives. The other videos focus on the installers for the major Linux distributions, which differ in the way they handle external drives. This video covers the issues that are common to all distributions and the subject of external drives in general. There are several uses for Linux on external drives. You can try another operating system or several operating systems without affecting your internal system. You can operate your computer if your internal drive fails. You can retrieve data from your internal drive if your main operating system becomes corrupted. And you can use it with another computer if your entire computer fails or has a portable system. The procedures I show here apply to all sorts of external drives from large hard drives to very small USB flash drives. I've used them all at one time or another. I prefer the large drives for extensive use but I've also got small lightweight systems installed on flash drives which you can carry in your pocket. I suggest using your setup utility to change the boot order so that your computer boots first from the internal CD DVD drive, secondly from your external USB drive, and third from your internal hard disk drive. This way, when a drive isn't present, it won't be used, so if you have nothing connected, your computer will automatically boot from its internal hard disk. If you have the USB drive connected, which you're going to use for your external drive, it will boot from that first. If you have a CD or DVD inserted in the optical drive, it will boot from that first. This is assuming you have a traditional BIOS. If you have a computer that came installed with Windows 8, 8.1, or 10, you probably have a UEFI secure boot system. That raises issues that are beyond the scope of this discussion. I hope to address them later, but for now I suggest you disable secure boot before trying installation on an external drive. With Windows 8, 8.1, and 10, even if you don't have secure boot, you'll have to disable the fast boot option in order to boot from Linux either internally or externally. Here I show the general order of installation. First you have to download the disk image or ISO file and burn it to a DVD or install it on a USB flash drive. I'm not going to go into the details here but it's the same for any operating system and you can find instructions on their websites or on YouTube. You can also buy a DVD or a USB flash drive with Linux installed. So when you're ready to go, insert the disk or attach the flash drive and restart the computer. After the live session is booted, but before beginning installation, attach the external drive, the target drive, to a USB port. See my other videos for the installation details. When the installation is complete, Remove the installation medium, leaving the external drive in place, and restart the computer. You'll first be greeted by the Grub2 boot menu, like this one for Fedora. They're all similar but not identical. The first item on the list will be the system that you last installed, and you'll have the option to boot from other systems using your up and down arrows. 
If you'll notice on my computer I have Windows on device SDA1 and I have Ubuntu 1510 on device SDA5. You can edit this menu later to get rid of all these options and just go directly into your external system or you can change the boot order. As I mentioned, you can install from either a DVD or from a USB flash drive. There are, however, some issues if you install from a flash drive. This diagram shows two computers. One has a single internal drive, which is the most common, and another has two internal drives. Concentrating on the computer with a single drive, that will be device SDA. And of course, since it's installed, it won't change. The first external drive will be device SDB. The optical drive will be device SR0, and it won't change either so it won't affect the naming of the hard drives. If your computer has two internal drives, one will be device SDA and one will be device SDB. The first external drive will be device SDC. I should mention here that many Windows computers have what appear to be two internal drives. They have a C drive and a D drive, but often these are not actual physical drives. These are logical drives. The C drive and the D drive are actually on the same physical drives. So now, going to the USB stick, and let's concentrate on the computer with one internal drive to keep it simple. That will be device SDA. Since you have to insert the USB stick first, that will be device SDB. And when you install your external drive, it will be device SDC. However, when you reboot, you're going to have removed your installation drive, and your target drive will now be SDB instead of SDC. This confuses some systems. They won't load properly because they're looking for a drive which is no longer there. Most systems do not use these drive names for loading. They use what's called the UUID, or Universal Unique Identification, which every piece of equipment carries. It doesn't change based on the order of installation, so you'll have no problem with those systems. In my case, I had a problem with Fedora. It booted, but it wouldn't load completely because it was looking for a drive that wasn't there. So with Fedora, I had to use a DVD for installation. With Ubuntu, I had no problems using the flash drive for installation. If you're not sure, use a DVD to play it safe. For simplicity, I started with a blank external drive for all of my other videos. You don't have to do this. Uh, you can prepare a blank drive in Windows or in Linux using Gparted but you can also create space in the drive from within the installer. However, you cannot create Linux partitions in Windows. This is how I created a blank drive using Gparted. I've started Gparted. This is device SDA and this is device SDB. I'm going to unmount the locked partition.
partition is unmounted. Now I'm going to click on Device Create Partition Table. I get a warning that this will erase all data on the disk. It's an MS-DOS partition table. Now I'm going to click on Apply. The partition table is created. The whole device is unallocated. So now I can exit Gparted. I show detailed partitioning from within the installer on my other videos, but there are many different partitioning schemes. The important thing is to make sure that all the partitions are on the external drive. Here are a few that I've made in the past. This is the simplest partitioning scheme for any kind of Linux. It's just two partitions a very large root partition which contains the whole system, the data and everything else and a small swap partition. There's a great deal of argument about how big to make the swap partition. Generally it should be slightly larger than the amount of random access memory or RAM that you have. In my case I have two gigabytes of RAM <coughs> so the smallest swap partition would be slightly more than two gigabytes. However, swap partition is often used for hibernation also. So if you're planning to hibernate your computer, the recommendation is for three times the amount of RAM. That's why I made this swap partition almost six gigabytes. This one was made when I installed Ubuntu to an external drive. This is very similar. It was made when I installed Watt OS 9, a very lightweight derivative of Ubuntu, to a USB stick with only 16 gigabytes. In this case, I made the swap partition the minimum 2.21 gigabytes and devoted the rest of the space to the root partition. Notice that in this case also the swap partition is at the end rather than the beginning. It doesn't make any difference. The system will find it wherever it is. This is a more complex partitioning set up when I installed Fedora. If you watch that video you'll recall that Fedora created this on its own once I selected standard partition. There is a 500 megabyte boot partition followed by a 3.75 gigabyte swap partition followed by a 50 gigabyte root partition and then the rest of the drive is taken up with an extended partition on SDB4 and that's because you can only have four physical partitions on a drive so the fourth one is usually an extended partition and then additional partitions can be added in this case they added one additional one SDB5 which is my home partition containing all of my data and very little of it is used at this point, of course. This was created when I installed Fedora on an earlier occasion and used completely automatic partitioning. It created a 500 megabyte boot partition and then devoted the rest of the disk to an LVM partition, logical volume management. It looks very simple, but there's a lot going on inside that partition. 
It can redistribute space among its various internal segments and can also keep snapshots of the system status at given points. As I've stated before, the only reason I don't like this type of partition is that it's opaque from the outside. I can't see the files in my folders. I can't add to them. I can't copy them. I can only access them from the installation itself. I set up this partitioning scheme to install six different versions of Linux on one terabyte drive. Uh, it only has one swap partition because no two versions of Linux will be running at the same time. Then it has two physical partitions, SDB2 and SDB3, and after that it has an extended partition outlined in light blue which takes up the rest of the drive. Inside the extended partitions are four logical partitions, SDB5, SDB6, SDB7, and SDB8. The Ubuntu installer will use existing partitions if you ask it to, but the Fedora installer will only use unallocated space. Now you can unallocate space from within the installer or do it in advance, but Fedora will not overwrite an existing partition. Take a look at the other videos in this series for details of the various installers. This is XRAM Tech. Thanks for watching.